you know, uh, I should uh, acknowledge the wonderful work being done by our translators. You know, I've been translating from English to Please give a hand. Uh, That's not easy. That's one of the most exhausting things to do. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Really appreciate it. I, for one, can barely spell Italian. So thanks to you, I'm able to understand. Uh, this is great. Uh, two absolutely fascinating talks. Uh, so we will open it up. I have a question for each of them. I have a ton of questions, but I don't, I don't think you are here to listen to me, but, but to them. So I'll just open it up, and then we will, uh, uh, there are people going around with microphones, um, so we can uh, open it up for conversation. So um, Dr. Berger, I want to start with where you ended. Uh, you ended with a series of what I would call desiderata, you know, desirable things to do, walkable cities, you know, are... Uh, uh, you know, relationships, um, and even quoted uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, you know, Bob Putnam's work. My question is twofold. One, um, what is the evidence that a walkable city or, or the series you outlined, playing on the streets, whatever, I'm, you know, as, as a metaphor, uh, somehow leads to greater satisfaction and greater happiness, number one. And if there is evidence, why the heck can't we do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, to start with the first uh, question, I think that there is, if you look at least, if you go back to the, uh, the, the work of uh, urban planning, um, then... Um, you will see that, that already back in the 70s, they, they advocated for the walkability of, of, of cities. From the studies that we did in Rotterdam, we see that walkability is related to uh, dissatisfaction with the neighborhood and also the uh, ease with uh, which people meet neighbors in the street. And that is also like what a walkable city does. A walkable cities increases meeting opportunities uh, for people mm -hmm. and it, it also makes a much more pleasant environment mm -hmm. because like less traffic and um, mm -hmm. uh, just a an, an, an much more calm atmosphere in which you can reside. Mm -hmm. Why we didn't do it like <laughs> we, we are a little bit stubborn <laughs> as human beings I think. Right. Uh, and it would also like it, 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 it's of course it doesn't come I think uh, with a policy you have to make decisions. You have like a limited budget uh, available. I think we also we, we changed our cities. Like depending a little bit on the country, mm -hmm. we start building them around the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, when we have to revert that, that would also come with with a cost. And also, yeah, people, many people like their car. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was using walkability as an illustrative argument, and I was joking, Luigi will be happy because you talked about the importance of culture and, and, and I'll say, cultural festival or uh, cultural gatherings um, and how they can lead to greater satisfaction uh, with the public wheel, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but those are all not expensive things, right? I mean, these are doable. It doesn't have to be an expensive opera, but, you know, even a street festival can do it. But we still seem to be unable to... Well, we need to also invest time. Eh? So, like, it's often not money that's the problem. It's also time that you allocate and, and free time that you decide to spend uh, with your community instead of in front of the TV right. or, or your computer. And in that sense, you see right. that leisure time and how it's uh -huh. spent uh -huh. has, has changed over time. And, okay. and we need to realize that it right. might some be, uh -huh. sometimes be more fun to, to spend like time with neighbors uh -huh. than in front of Netflix. Right, you know? yeah. So I may have a bone to pick with you on the TV as, as a media per yeah. studies person, but we'll, we'll come to that at some other time. I, I make the and same so, mistakes, so, by right. the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it's a, let me ask you, I think I want to, this is absolutely fascinating. So, um, you know, Switzerland is an interesting example. You went through uh, with great uh, breadth, uh, not necessarily the breadth because you were covering the waterfront, so to speak. Um, and, and, and a couple of things stood out 
for me. And I, I thought maybe you can uh, amplify that a bit. Uh, so when I looked at your satisfaction ratings and you had this phrase, uh, language assimilated foreigners, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and then you had young people and less educated. To me, that was somewhat shocking that younger people are even more dissatisfied than immigrants who could potentially face limited opportunities and in discrimination. So, so tell, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. We, because globally, we are talking about this sort of a mental health crisis among the young. Uh, I, and even epidemic, we overuse the word epidemic, but there is certainly a serious concern. So what's going on there? Ich, ich denke, es gibt zwei ähm, wichtige Antworten auf diese Frage. Die eine hat sehr viel mit, mit, mit Jungsein zu tun. Es, äh, aus, aus meiner Sicht wäre es äh, sehr bedenklich, wenn, wenn junge Personen in, in, der, äh, in der Schweiz, aber auch international, ähm, ähm, glücklich oder sehr, äh, außerordentlich zufrieden wären mit unserer Gesellschaft. Ich denke, es ist auch Aufgabe im Erwachsenenwerden, äh, einen gewiss, gewissen revolutionäre Gedanken zu haben, sich abzugrenzen vom, vom, vom Status quo, von der Situation, wie sie bis heute äh, gewesen ist. Äh, und, und entsprechend äh, sehe ich das auch nicht als problematisch. Der, der andere Punkt erscheint mir fast äh, wichtiger. Ähm, tatsächlich ist, ist äh, die, das Thema ähm, äh, geistige Gesundheit bei, bei jungen Personen ein, ein sehr großes Problem, ein sehr wichtiges Problem. Äh, haben Sie Probleme mit der, mit der englischen Übersetzung? Okay. Uh, you don't understand me? Uh, I don't think it's being translated, uh, that part. Can you summarize that for us? Uh, Okay. okay, I, I try in English. Uh, okay. Maybe, yeah. You know. That will be a disaster okay. for me and for you. I'm sorry, but uh, I'll okay. try. Your, um, your English is much better than my German. So the, let's, yes. the, the, the first three words, but uh, <laughs> it will be worse. Okay. So uh, the, the second problem is, is the mental illness, the mental health of young people. Right. And that is uh, really a, f a, phen a phenomenon uh, that is uh, new. Uh, and it's uh, really problematic. I, I have no solutions for that, but it's not a problem that we, we, we uh, observe uh, uh, the, the same way in, in the past. Right. So do you have any... Uh, so you are looking at so much data, and do you have any insights why... I, I'm not even asking for solutions right now, because I think a lot of us are yeah. uh, working globally around issues of solution. But do you know why? Why are they unhappy here? You know, you look at this. You look at the life opportunities, and yeah, you know, I think it's it's quite difficult, uh, systemically difficult for young people to 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 get uh, adults. That's uh, one uh, very uh, systemic problem. Uh, but the other, you mentioned it. Uh, I think social media and advertising is is a big challenge for young people uh, for for uh, be becoming themselves and for becoming uh, this personality, this adult personality, and social media um, disturbs uh, uh, this, this kind of, of uh, self-finding. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, it's, it's a hypothesis, yeah. I don't know exactly. Yeah, I, I must say, um, the evidence on the role of media, especially social media, is somewhat mixed. I hate to uh, call Julianne on this. Do you have, you know, she was... Uh, a, co a co-author on a landmark report that just uh, came out uh, from the National Academies. I hate to do this to you, Julia. Do you want to comment on that? Or Sorry, she will hate me forever. You know, so. <laughs> I will never. I will never hate you, Vish. Um, <laughs> so is the, just I want to make sure I understand clearly, is the question around the role of social media in um, this growing concern around youth mental health? Right, okay. right. Yeah, um, so there, what the data suggests is that there are these small effects um, where there, this has been linked to poor mental health. Um, there is debate on how to interpret those small effects. <laughs> And, and this is um, very hotly debated even among mm -hmm. academics. Um, 
And so some uh, uh, suggest that these small effects are, um, are, are uh, trivial, while others argue that small effects on very large scale can have very um, kind of uh, powerful yeah. kinds of right. effects. Mm -hmm. And, and so it really um, it is kind of interesting how uh, um, the same findings are, are being interpreted wildly different even among experts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think there, of course, you know, like all things, we need more evidence, better, and not just, I shouldn't say more evidence. I would say better evidence. Better evidence, evidence. right. Um, yeah. Because we actually have a ton of data. The problem is, is the methodologies are often inadequate to really um, draw strong conclusions. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would argue for um, better kinds of evidence. And for um, others who I know in the room who do this kind of research also understand the challenges of that. And um, it's not easy. Um, so I, it, I, I don't fault the researchers in any way because there are inherent challenges in doing this so. Great. Thank you. Um, I can always rely on Julianne to <laughs> lead me path through a, the right path, right? You know, so thank you for indulging me. Uh, the reason I invoked her is this comes up often, and uh, uh, in the interest of self-disclosure, Laura and I and our lab has been also doing work in this area. I didn't want to put our own research up there, but 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 the evidence is small and somewhat mixed, you know, around media. And so, and it fascinates me. Right now, they have the opportunities. The question is, you know, why is there this global? Concern, and you know, it, it, everywhere, not in just one place. You know? It would also be the case for social media that, that the effects are very heterogeneous. So for right. some people, exactly it, right. it's right, it's beneficial, and for exactly. others, it right. can be very detrimental. And that's also like something that we need to do in happiness research better. Right. Uh, let's find out right. what works for whom under which circumstances. Right. right, and and what worries me is people are jumping the gun, right? Like our Surgeon General yesterday. Uh, released a, an advisor and is asking um, uh, the Congress to, to take some steps to restrict uh, and put label, etc. Uh, let me open it up. Uh, Akopa is waiting. Don't disappoint him. You know, so uh, any questions for the audience? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Very happy to be here. <laughs> Um, so I have these thoughts that I would like to understand if it's true or not in front of this. And because we are facing that we have a longevity, we are living more. Mm. So our population is becoming older mm -hmm. as before. And the percentage of people older, more than 50 or 60, is increasing. And on the other side, we are facing that we have less newborn. So young people are minus in minus representative also in front of politicians for example so when we vote there are more elderly people voting than young people voting mm -hmm. and we face this also during brexit in england for example when people said elderly people decided for our future as young people didn't want to brexit but elderly people because of our because i put myself in the elderly we have a different thoughts, different view, of course. So how do you think that this is also part of this not happiness of a young people in front of politician decisions? How do you think that this young person can uh, think that we are deciding for them against their thoughts? How can we manage that? Right. Thank that's you. A, that's a real fascinating question. Both of you talked about notion of participation and inclusiveness. That, so do you want to start off and yes. then we can go with Dr. Berger? So. In, in Switzerland, the, the answer is, is, is quite easy. 60% um, of all people uh, above uh, 65 years old are, are voting uh, or, or taking part at uh, the elections. And uh, 
uh, 30 percent of all people uh, 30 years old and, uh, and, and younger are uh, taking part. So the problem is a problem of, of, of a, is a decision problem. The, the, the younger people doesn't want to, to take part on elections and, and rotations in Switzerland. So if this problem exists, I think it exists. Uh, it, it can be corrected if a younger people goes uh, to vote and, and uh, elections in, in Switzerland, and why young people do doesn't go uh, uh, don't go to to vote? In, so that's a, a quite complicated uh, question. I I think uh, that the the, the um, um, science uh, thinks uh, that uh, it's it's. Uh, it's of, uh, because uh, young people have other interests than politics. So the, the data doesn't uh, matter uh, of the results, and I have shown uh, they are uh, lucky uh, without taking part. So in Switzerland, the problem is structural and is, is, is a problem, but it's not a problem in, in, the, in the feelings of, of young people. Dr. Berger, you want to address that? I want to follow up a bit on that. Yeah, I, c I can only briefly talk about like the situation in the Netherlands where we have like a an, an, an similar issue also with political participation of the youth, which is also like rooted, I think, in the, the, the youth indeed has very different ways the country should go. You also see it in the terms of differences in values. So they are much stronger in terms of post-materialist values. And that is also like a call for yeah, including the youth also more in, in, in where a country, where our country would go. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we are seeing this in the U.S. too. I mean, those who are from the U.S. Uh, uh, realize this. I think, and to me, it's just not about voting, right? You know, voting is a one-time event, but it's this participation time and again, and our politicians often say they don't even hear from youth, right, on issues that affect them, right? They, they get 500 telegrams or so, you know, or messages these days from other interest groups, but certainly not you. Something about mobilization and opportunity structure, I guess. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, other questions? È stata interessante. Sono d'accordo che un appartamento spazioso, una buona economia dei giochi di divertimento siano utili alla felicità. Ma quello che ho um, trovato mancante in questa conferenza è la parola responsabilità, perché penso che la responsabilità potrebbe essere un incentivo per dare alle popolazioni una certa felicità, perché la responsabilità richiede anche dei valori morali interni e questo um, arricchisce la persona interiormente. Senza di questo penso che è un po' difficile raggiungere la, veramente la felicità. Poi ho, ho sentito parlare dei giovani e verso i giovani ho sentito soprattutto la parola patologia. Però tra i giovani non sono tutti patologici. Tra i giovani ci sono anche i piccoli delinquenti e anche quelli che si fanno trascinare. Noi qui in Ticino, per esempio, manchiamo di una figura professionale eh, psichiatrica, forense, infantile, e non c'è. Per cui eh, bisognerebbe fare questo, prima di tutto, questa eh, differenza. E poi avevo notato anche questo qui, que appunto, questa questione della responsabilità è un aspetto che viene molto a mancare. E vorrei sentire cosa ne dite voi. Grazie. So the notion of duty, uh, fiduciary response, I mean, not fiduciary, any kind of duty and obligations has not come up in any of our conversations. What do you think? I, I can start. Um, Go ahead. I, I have my the, the, the strong opinion that in the end, everyone is responsible for their own happiness. So responsibility is important. If you look at what a government can do or what an organization they can do, they can support uh, uh, the, the, uh, the circumstances so that people can flourish. Having said that, of course, some people have been more lucky in life than, than others. So some people need more support than others to uh, come at that same level of, 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 of happiness. Some are born in uh, like worse circumstances and have to literally 
climb the happiness ladder. And I think that's all, also a government is, 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 is for. Maybe I sound very <laughs> socialistic at, the, at this point, uh, or, or, but uh, the, I, I think that there, there is a role for the government in that. Uh. Mm -hmm. if we have made uh, the same survey in, in 27 uh, European countries uh, in the UA, uh, and, and uh, what we see is uh, all uh, together is that the political responsibility or higher political responsibility named uh, direct democracy uh, uh, is, is, is a, a, a very important puzzle uh, for for uh, being uh, for having a satisfaction with the political uh, system in and in all 27 European countries uh, there is a, a, a need or a preference for for a, a direct democratic way of uh, decision making in in politics. So in Switzerland, it, it functions uh, and it is part of the high satisfaction. In all the uh, European countries, there is uh, the preference or the, the need for, for this. Uh, and we can uh, think that uh, the, the satisfaction in these uh, countries will, will rise if, if there is direct democracy. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, and Good thank morning. you for this beautiful event. Um, I, as a, I am a, a citizen of the world. I live here in Switzerland, but I am of Italian origin, and I live, I've been a lot in the US. So I think I have quite a good view of different uh, cultures and differ, uh, different approaches. I like very much the, uh, the approach uh, um, uh, you were, your, um, sorry, Mr. Barger, uh, were having, I like it a lot. Also, the idea of the, um, making the cities more enjoyable. And what I would say is that, oh, I am also mother of three kids, so <laughs> I see them with their social media. Um, what I think is important, I don't know if you agree, is uh, also working on the cultural level trying to help the parents, help the kids, help the, help the teachers to teach them again how important it is to be in relationships with people and trying to, as you said, create conditions to meet. Because end of the day, for example, what I see here in Lugano, there is a lot of activities going on trying to make people meet. And there is really a lot of effort, really lots of beautiful things happening, but then in the end, people don't, re some of them do not succeed in opening themselves. So this idea of being more vulnerable, of being more in the acceptance of the other, this should be something, I don't know if you agree, that should be really um, given, uh, teach to the people. Because end of the day, even if we listen to uh, all the uh, meetings we also had last year in Como with Wu Hazo or anywhere else, it's about relationships and true relationships. So it's really like trying to find a way, I don't know how, maybe just going back to the old culture, to our grandparents, our original roots, and teach that staying with the people, meeting foreigners, it's just enriching. And even the bad ones have something, as the lady was saying, even the, the, the more fragile population has something to give, to teach. So I think this is another approach that could be taken. Right. I don't know if you agree yeah. about let's, this. Let's see what Dr. Berker has to say and then Dr. Beer. Um, in, in general, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of teaching kids life skills. So. Um, indeed, how do you form social relationships, but also resilience? How do you deal with difficult situations uh, that you encounter? And, uh, and I think that that is something that is insufficiently done in, in schools at, at the moment. We are currently trying to do this in like a pilot in, in the Netherlands. So there have been some programs developed to teach uh, kids that. But it already starts with the teachers. So 
like without happy teachers, it's also very <laughs> difficult to teach these kind of life skills uh, uh, to people. So uh, in, in the way we work is that we, we try to make the teachers happy, learn them on how they can teach this to the kids and try to create a an, uh, an happier community, which also means like involving, uh, and, and that's a very nice point that you make, involving the neighborhood like uh, in, in the schooling of, of kids, like uh, the, in, in the neighborhood often next to the schools, like our elderly homes, and they always love to see the kids. And in that sense, uh, you can give them also like an additional purpose if they, if they, if they like to and uh, increase the happiness in their, in their lives. Uh, very, very good ideas. Uh, there are... Uh I, I would like just uh, um, a comment. Uh, it's very interesting what you said. I am a Swiss person. I've been living 20 years now in Italy. So I see Switzerland like a hyper-democratic environment. When you have a hyper-situation, why should they be active? No, because everything is going fine. Everything is, is organized. Everything is under control. What I suggest, because uh, now I live in Italy, and it's uh, just... The contrary, it's, uh, everything is a mess, and so it's very creative because it's such a mess. Uh, what I suggest is that the politics should uh, reach the register of language of youth. The register of language is not uh, our uh, communication tools and our communication means. The register of language of youth is TikTok, is YouTube, is whatever else they have invented, which I don't even know. So. Uh, the challenge is to uh, have the kids learning how to participate because it's, it's a challenge, it's uh, interesting, it's social, it's uh, uh, whatever it is. But if you don't speak the same language, they will never hear. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Mark? Um, there's a big mystery that's been puzzling me that I'd like to ask both of you, or three of you, is... You know, this year, in the, there's two reports coming out of Gallup. There's the, the World Happiness Report, and then there's the Global Emotions Report. Now, in the World Happiness Report, Finland is on top, and Switzerland is pretty high up. But in the, in the Global Emotions Report that nobody seems to know about, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Paraguay are number one. So how does one explain this? Not my problem, their problem. They're the speakers. <laughs> so. difficult, uh, difficult question. I, I think uh, it's, it's um, one of the, the wonder of, of being happy that it, it's possible to be happy in, in, in very different environments. I, I can be happy in, 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 a, in a region of Africa, in, in a nearly or really poor situation and I can be happy in, in Switzerland and, and that's a, a, a positive uh, uh, message uh, of all this but, but the, the exact question I have no idea why this is like that. Um, it's a, it's a complicated and it's also like the, the, the complication is that there are different disciplines in which uh, different conceptualizations of, of happiness were developed. Uh, the Gallup World Poll uses a, a quite pure cognitive evaluation of happiness. So it asks people, uh, how does your current life compare to the most ideal life you have in mind on, on, on the Cantrell ladder? Um, the positive evaluation or the positive effect, negative effect, asked about emotions uh, that you experienced over the past days. A more ideal measure to compare would have been an, an emotions that you experienced over the past uh, months. Uh, in essence, you also see a an, 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 an considerable correlation between the two. So the statistical correlation, if I'm not mistaken, is around 0.5 uh, uh, usually. Um, but there are, of course, uh, you can be dissatisfied with life, but having good days emotionally. And you also see that, for example, back if you look in, 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 in the Western world at the people who are unemployed, uh, they are dissatisfied with their, well, current situation. Uh, so ideally they would have like have a job. 
But in essence, if they, you see on how they spend their time during the day, they don't feel that more miserable than um, uh, somebody who is working. Uh, so like they have, for example, more uh, leisure time. And for, for that reason, uh, like, like uh, yeah, I feel quite reasonably uh, good. So, so in, in that sense, like the two are related, huh? um, uh, but it's not that it's it's one. It, it are two. You can see it as two different dimensions of of, of happiness. Uh, the, also, if you look at huh, the, the, mer the if you look at emotions, and if you like diminish the time frame, huh? so you can ask about emotions over the month, over the year, yesterday, huh? in this hour. Uh, uh, it's, it's also you come gradually towards like the concept of pleasure, uh, um, and uh, so the, the, the pleasures, uh, good pleasures, it it, it, it is like uh, the more pleasures you have, uh, the more likely you will be satisfied. But it's not one on one. Uh, add another. Yeah. Yeah, John, I was going to call on you anyway. I can't let you escape on this one. <laughs> and also. No, we, sp we spend a lot of time naturally studying both the emotions and the life evaluations in these data. Uh, one of the problems it was an argument over the years between Danny and the rest of us that he's very much like the idea or, of simple yes, no. And the rest of us really preferred scales. And the scales came, were adopted for the life evaluation questions because that came from the Diener camp and the emotional things, which Danny really wanted the overall evaluation to be about the prevalence of positives over negatives with binary questions on emotions. Mm -hmm. And he, he, in the end, he was convinced. So he's, he can't be in this room, alas, with us now. But he would say, the right measure is the scaled overall life evaluation. And part of the reason was the binary measures of emotions uh, simply were too, too rough, too crude. Uh, and you know, did you experience any, basically, of the same of the motion yesterday? A second point that I think was more fundamentally important in, in that debate between the, the uh, net emotions being a, an appropriate measure of the quality of a person's life rather than their overall assessment of the quality of, of, of the uh, life was that the uh, effects are pretty small running from the emotions to at the aggregate level we routinely find that the average negative emotions in a country don't translate into an effect in the overall. The positive emotions definitely do uh, across countries, and so they're in there. Uh, would you use them as a substitute for the overall? I don't think you'd ever want to do that, uh, simply because they're a component of the total, and uh, emotions can differ, but you don't want to look, I don't think you really want to look at the specific places where the binary question in a country at a time. We, year after year, we'll find a puzzling country with a puzzling average for a particular emotional question. You have to remember that this is uh, just a binary question for a relatively small sample of people for something that might well be passing. Right. May I ask so a you had, uh, question? So the last word for you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Why, has, why has Gallup never changed it? Because skills for effect measures have been used widely in the, in the, in the literature. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, and it's part of our advice to them. But we don't run the poll. <laughs> right. I think we should start collecting some money and pay Gallup yes. to <laughs> have our kites and questions. The donation hat is going around. Uh, so we can go on and on. This is fascinating. I only have 500 questions to ask them, but I won't do that to you because we have a coffee break. So, but let's give a hand again, another round of applause to the speakers. Thank you.